All right, everyone. I believe we can go ahead and get started here. So um, here we go. All right. Um, so welcome to our fall summit for Food Batch 8. My name is Brian, and I'm the global director of our food program here at Plug and Play. Uh, so this is day three of our travel programs, which include retail, supply chain, new materials, and media and advertising. Uh, so this is a program solely out of Silicon Valley Office for Food. Uh, our following programs will be considered hybrid programs out of our Silicon Valley and Chicago locations, what we now call U.S. food. So once the world opens up, we'll see activities scheduled in both locations. Uh, so the stars pitching today. At one point, we're part of our top 100 list. This is a list of roughly 100 startups that represent technology interests of the board members of our food program. Uh, so after the first round of voting, uh, 27 startups made it into our selection day pitch event, 15 made it into the program. So congratulations all of you made it, it's not easy. Uh, so today you'll hear from these 15 who will pitch their technology and showcase some of the progress they made uh, since they joined the program about three months ago. So please take a moment to look through, um, actually if you go to the last slide, uh, so please take a moment to, um, uh, to look through uh, uh, the full summary of activities for the week. You'll find over 100 startups pitching uh, and speakers presenting on that link right there. Um, so today you only have me for um, uh, roughly 10 minutes, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we'll get to the, the startups shortly. So um, um, yeah, basically, you know, today we'll have, you know, the focus will be the startups, then we'll have a, a keynote from the Good Food Institute. Um, uh, we'll have some final remarks and a networking boards. So we expect to wrap up around 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. So uh, today's highlight will obviously be the startups, um, but please keep in mind that um, uh, we'll not have questions during, uh, but we will host a Q&A session afterwards, and uh, you can meet with all your favorite startups via Remo. Um, after each pitch, you'll be prompted with a asking if you'd like to be put in touch with the startup. Um, so there's plenty of ways to connect, but if there's any problems, feel free to reach out to me or any of our team, and we'll get you set up. Um, so on the left slide, you can see the startups that are pitching today. Uh, on the right, you'll see the corporations that made this session possible. Uh, these are the companies that guide the technology focus of our program and engage most heavily with apps through events, deal flows, and eventually the pilots and investments. Uh, these are also the companies support our programs to expand to new locations. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so the goal of our program is really to identify the most pressing technologies that impact the future of our food system. Uh, these are technologies that impact the health and flavor of our food and the environment around us. Um, so really the technology focus areas and partners are shown here. We use these areas to assemble our top 100 list and eventually decide the companies that you'll see pitching today. Uh, focus areas change over time. So recently we did see a big shift towards novel proteins, sweeteners, microbiome technology within that uh, larger ingredient innovation space. Um, as we expand to Chicago, our focus will again shift as we take additional interest in packaging technology, uh, as well as food safety and supply chain areas. So I'll spend a little time on this slide. Over the past year, our world faced significant environmental, economic, health challenges. The food industry has been, been relatively uh, resilient. So despite some publicized uh, challenges in the meatpacking industry due to close working conditions and in retail due to the run on grocery items, uh, it's been very resilient. Um, last year, investment in food related technologies reached an all time high of $3.4 billion of investment, uh, which is 70% greater than the year prior. And in just the first half of 2020, we've already seen $4.8 billion of, a, of invested capital in the space. Um, so the alternative protein space has been particularly active this year. Uh, Impossible Foods is probably the most notable company in the space. They rose half and scale their plant-based burger operation. Uh, on the seafood alternative side, Blue Nalu uh, secured $20 million in additional financing and, and an ultra for alternative dairy, Perfect Day rose 140 million. Uh, so it's been a pretty amazing growth for this space, and I'm sure our keynote will, will talk more about uh, the protein side. Uh, you know, the animal meat industry globally is a two, $2 trillion dollar market, and meat constitutes less than uh, less than one percent of this market at, at eight billion dollars. So really, the, the growth of this space is idle. 
uh, for environment due, our, due to our planet's inability to increase animal meat production at the same rate as global demand. So we are reaching what's called peak meat. Um, so we spend a lot of time on proteins and it captures a lot of attention and it's very important. Uh, but there are other big, big successes in the food world to be aware of. Food waste and food loss cause significant economic and environmental waste. Groups like Appeal Sciences have been very successful. They made headway this year in the food preservation space with their edible cook raising $250 million. Uh, so we believe the food industry will continue to provide ample investment opportunities due to continued innovation and consumer demand throughout. And we believe this will continue through the upcoming recession. So um, some of you may know this, uh, my humble beginnings at Ladera, uh, I joined Plug and Play uh, four years ago after pitching my own company uh, to Plug and Play. Um, and eventually I, I landed in, in their food, food, which has been a really great experience. Um, so over time, Plug and Play has gone through many changes as we figured out our identity and value offering. And, and now we're in over 30 offices around the world with over 500 employees, all dedicated to finding amazing startup technologies and connecting them with our uh, partner corporations to help them scale. So since we started in our program has expanded to several locations uh, as a food program, including Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Milan, Italy, uh, which was last year. And then this year we started in Nanjing, China, Fargo, North Dakota, Topeka, Kansas, and Bangkok, Thailand. So I'll, I'll talk about some of these offices. So this July, we launched our food program in Thailand. This program shows the startups out of the APAC region, uh, and they have several different interest areas, two being indoor agriculture and ingredient innovation. So the next event's October 29th. Email if you'd like more information on this. And uh, this year we launched a program in China thanks to our partnership with the city government of Nanjing and corporate partners, including We're excited to partner with the Walmart Food Safety Collaboration Center and their innovation pipeline. Next event will round table discussion in November and we'll be inviting partners, including Mondel, BASF, PepsiCo, and Mars, uh, that have already engaged uh, with this division. So um, on October 21st, so next week, we are officially launching our animal health and ag program in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, this program is focused on three key areas, uh, livestock monitoring, diagnostics, and alternative feed. So again, um, it's, we're, we're launching this next week, so please reach out soon if you'd like to participate. And uh, lastly, as uh, many of you know, I wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to talk about Chicago. So in February, our program expands to Chicago, and this is primarily to better serve our partners. Most of our partners are in Chicago or further east. So having a local presence can be really important, skill flow and programming. So um, our next event will be on November 17th, focused on food packaging. So again, reach out to me if you'd like to learn more. And here you can see uh, my contact information. So I'll do my best to, to get you some answers uh, if you have some questions. Um, but uh, participate in Chicago, Topeka, China, China, or Thailand. Please just reach out and we'll, we'll get connected. So uh, before we introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to announce uh, our two new corporate partners. First is the third largest company in Mexico with over 1,500 products, 25 brands. Uh, their slogan is con toda confianza, which means with trust. So their goal is to become better every day and have set innovation as one of their pillars in this mission. So we are very excited to have our first Mexican food partner, Grupo Herdes. There we go. <laughs> uh, and our second uh, new partner for the food program is the largest company in the world by revenue. Uh, we are very excited to start working with Walmart's Food Safety Collaboration Center and their Food Safety Innovation Pipeline. So please welcome, uh, briefly speak, uh, Will Watts, the Senior Director of the Walmart Food Safety Collaboration Center. And Will, if you're there, uh, yep. you can take the stage. All right, Brian, thank you for passing the mic, taking the virtual stage. And thank you to all of our partners, friends at Plug and Play, just really quick. Uh, we recently collaborated with Plug and Play for our Global Food Safety Innovation Pipeline. Uh, this has been a, wow, uh, four years now, I had much more hair when we actually started the program. Uh, to backtrack a little bit, I'm with the Food Safety Collaboration Center. Uh, so of course, I'm probably everyone's familiar with Walmart. 
less familiar with the collaboration center that was set up about five years ago as part of a $25 million commitment by Walmart to improving food safety, specifically in China, though that mission continues to grow globally. And with this fourth year of the innovation pipeline, we really are doing things on a global scale. And so we partnered with Plug and Play just to tap Walmart and the Food Safety Collaboration Center into the global startup community. Obviously, when we talk about food safety, we're talking about a subset of food and agriculture. So it's very niche. And I just like to, again, thank our partners at Plug and Play for getting out there and scouting some really quality companies. Um, I think the most telling feedback that I can share with everyone, the innovation pipeline is an iterative process where we go from a group of finalists, we take them through a behind the scenes process, a mentoring process with Walmart and our other corporate partners like Starbucks, PepsiCo, uh, Cargill is also a part of it. I heard Cargill mentioned earlier. And then they finally get to pitch uh, to decision makers within each of the companies. And for the Walmart portion, we had our global VP for food safety on the phone call, uh, listening through the pitches. And her comment to me afterwards was, it's not a matter of who we're gonna uh, partner with, but matter of prioritization, meaning that uh, she wanted to work with all of them. It's just a matter of how much capacity do we have, especially as we continue to deal with the ripple effects of COVID to take on these pilots. So um, that was great feedback. And I think the highest praise that we could have gotten for that program that uh, over the rest of the fall, getting into spring, we'll be looking forward to a lot of new pilots, POCs being run in our stores here in the United States and in China. So big thank you to Plug and Play and a uh, quick pitch to our Global Food Safety Innovation Pipeline. It's a yearly event uh, and we look forward to maybe seeing some of you that are on today's call join us for next year. So thank you so much, Brian, back to you. Excellent, thanks Will. Uh, yeah, looking forward to working with you closer. So, um, you know, that uh, wraps up my portion. So I'd like to pass it off to our keynote speaker. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll introduce Nate Cross. Um, Nate Crosser, uh, Nate may, uh, may be familiar with you as he presented with us before on the topic of protein innovation. Uh, so the Good Food Institute and consults with startups and investors with the sole goal of accelerating the development of the alternative protein market. Uh, I'm excited for, your, for all of you to hear his talk and I hope you walk away with some some useful insights. So please welcome Nate. Thanks, Brian. Pleasure to be here. I will get my screen shared. And please confirm uh, once you can see it. We are good. All right, great. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be speaking with you all today at Plug and Play's Fall Expo. As you're uh, probably seeing in the news, the food system seems to be very poised for transformation and, and clearly, as you see from these startups, uh, really more transformation probably in the next 10 years than in, in entire generations before us. Uh, there, there's a lot happening here, you know, indoor farming, genetic, genetic engineering of crops, microbiome research, food is medicine, personalized nutrition, robotics and big data and farming. Uh, there are world-class companies working in many of these areas in today's expo. However, uh, I would argue that nothing is poised to as rapidly and fundamentally transform our agri-food sector than the explosion in innovation and how our center of plate staples are produced. Namely, how applying biotechnology to food production has enabled a new wave of ingredients and commensurate processing methods that allow us to produce meat, eggs, and dairy pr uh, products without animals as a technology. Together, we call these technologies alternative proteins. Uh, as Brian mentioned, my name is Nate Crosser. I'm a startup growth specialist at the Good Food Institute. And uh, for those not yet familiar with the Good Food Institute, uh, very quickly, we are a donor-funded nonprofit that is dedicated to accelerating the shift to a sustainable, healthy, and just food system through innovation and protein production methods. We employ over 100 staff in six countries with three key programmatic departments. In science and technology, our team of PhD scientists works to advance the foundational science of alternative proteins through drafting white papers, identifying white spaces, and funding research. Our corporate engagement team builds relationships with the world's biggest food manufacturers, meat companies, restaurants, and retailers to help them capitalize on opportunities in alternative proteins. And our policy team advocates for fair regulation of 
and government investment in alternative proteins. In sum, GFI achieves its mission by acting as an accelerator for the supply side of the alternative protein industry. So over this 30 minute presentation, I'll provide an overview of what is driving our current agri-food transformation, zooming in on the technological enablers of the transition, particularly alternative protein biotechnology in the form of plant-based, cultivated, and fermentation-derived proteins. I'll define the types of alternative protein, briefly describe the technology, and highlight applications and areas of opportunity. Then I'll put the transition in the context of historical agricultural transformations. Finally, we'll look at where we are now in terms of investment and adoption, plus some expectations for what is coming. So let's go to drivers. One of the questions that drives our work at GFI is, how do we feed nearly 10 billion people by 2050? Unfortunately, our current system of producing protein through intensive animal agriculture is too expensive in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, biodiversity loss, zoonotic disease, antibiotic resistant disease, land use, water use, animal feed to edible food conversion, and supply chain volatility. I'm sure you've seen the stats by now. It is incredibly unlikely that we can scale up or optimize the current system to accommodate 30% population growth over the next 30 years. That would be crazy for us to count on doing so. That would be like assuming that increases in fuel efficiency and gas powered machines means that we won't run out of oil and we don't need to look at renewables. Necessity is obviously the mother of all invention and this has led to pioneers radically rethinking how we can turn agricultural resources into the foods that people want to eat. So the next driver and the one that makes all this possible is consumer demand for alternatives to meat, eggs, and dairy that are produced in a more sustainable way uh, that are also healthier. The primary cause of the growth of the alternative protein industry um, has primarily been a consumer interest in reducing animal product consumption by mainstream consumers, a much larger segment than vegans and vegetarians. Beyond Meat states, for example, that 93% of the uh, customers also buy animal-based meat. Two-thirds of U.S. customers reported that they are reducing their consumption of at least one type of meat, uh, uh, with the majority of those reducing red and processed meat. However, around a quarter are also reducing their consumption of either seafood or poultry. 41% of U.S. households now buy plant-based milk. As I'll discuss, although consumers are driven to animal product reduction for a variety of reasons, purchase decisions are primarily driven by taste, price, and availability of products. We are just barely on the cusp of having any animal-free products that can compete on taste, price, and availability, let alone all three. We expect that when there are companies that can deliver that trifecta, consumers will transition in droves. Generally, it's important to note just how engaged millennials and Gen X are in the plant-based category. 30% of millennials in the US who are poised to become the largest generation eat meat alternatives every day. We are seeing, uh, yeah, and then millennials plus Gen X together make up 67% of volume sales of plant-based proteins in the US. And we're seeing similar trends in other parts of the world, including the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, several of the European countries, and then new kind of waves of, of uh, plant-based products in, in China and India as well. Uh, the next driver, established companies are turning to alternative proteins as a cornerstone of their sustainability strategy. So alternative proteins are important to the bottom line and risk mitigation for businesses. The Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return Initiative, a global network of investors addressing ESG issues and protein supply chains, has a great catalog of research explaining this connection on their website. According to FAIR, 40% of large food companies now have dedicated plant-based protein teams. Uh, as Brian mentioned, you've seen the processes, uh, the, the product problems with meat processing uh, due to COVID. And uh, because of that, FAIR has, um, uh, according to FAIR, U.S. meat giant stocks plummeted 25% uh, as Goldman Sachs listed livestock alongside oil is one of the two most precarious commodities for investors in the next year. Outside of the risks inherent to animal agriculture, like human and animal disease, all proteins are just more efficient. Rather than relying on just-in-time supply chains and manual production lines like in meat, egg, and dairy industries, alternative proteins can allow for storage of ingredients and better automation of production. Alternative proteins can also be easier for companies to work with, such as easier food safety management, faster cook times, and better tolerances in processing. So why all of this hype and focus when veggie products have been around for decades? 
Up until quite recently, we are in the plant-based 1.0 or the veggie stage. Consumers associated plant-based products with hippies, sprouts, and unseasoned tofu. Products that were intended for consumers with a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle. Ultimately, what happened was a business model innovation based on the belief that animal-free products would compete with animal products if we spent the requisite time and capital on research and development. Beyond and Impossible showed that with their, showed that with their beef uh, burger products, and now hundreds more companies are making the same bet. As a result, today, plant-based is starting to look very different. Plant-based 2.0 is driven by innovative, tasty products that are made to satisfy meat eaters. This biomimicry approach has only been made possible by innovations in manufacturing technology and ingredients. We bucket the ingredient and processing innovations underpinning this biomimicry approach into three foundational technology pillars. First is plant-based proteins. Second is animal cell culture, also called cultivated or cell-based meat. And third is fermentation, also known as non-animal cell culture. I'll go slightly more in depth on those later. First to plant-based, which is the most mature category of the budding alternative protein industry. Despite frequent headlines and massive sales successes, the first wave of biomimicked meat, egg, and dairy products is well less than a decade old. The uh, brainstorm behind plant-based meat, egg, and dairy is that plants and animals are largely made up of the same biochemical compounds. So for every protein, lipid, or functional compound in the dozen or so uh, animal species that we eat, we can find an analog or replacement among the hundreds of thousands of species in the plant kingdom. If a replacement doesn't exist in nature, we can make it through mechanical, chemical, or biological technology applications like pressure heating, enzymes, or genetic engineering, respectively. Companies can now even produce actual animal proteins and plant hosts through a process called plant molecular farming, which has its roots in the pharmaceutical industry. In the meat context, the core challenge is to get globular plant, plant proteins to act like fibular plant proteins, as well as to get liquid plant lipids to become semi-solid fats, like animal fats. So now I'll highlight some of the most exciting emerging technologies enabling plant-based 2.0. Namely is both the discovery of novel ingredients and the optimization of existing ag agricultural staples to be fit for purpose in alternative protein applications. The first wave of plant-based foods were primarily comprised of soybeans and wheat, but the pioneers of the plant-based food 2.0 movement realized that there are tens of thousands of edible plant species that can be explored and optimized for their protein content and functionality. Beyond, use, Beyond Meat's use of pea protein as a protein base, Impossible Foods' is use of soy hemoglobin, and Just Inc.'s use of mung beans for its functional plant-based liquid eggs are a few examples of the magic that many companies are trying to emulate. There are many novel protein sources that show promise, including duckweed, chickpea, oat, quinoa, and hemp, as well as numerous oil seeds, pulses, cereals, and millets. Outside of the plant kingdom, trophic, triton algae innovations, and others are unlocking red algae as a source of amino acids, coloration, and functionality for plant-based foods. Many of the blockbuster plant-based meat products to date have been ground or minced products like burgers, sausages, and nuggets partially due to the difficulty associated with imparting fibrous 3D structure to those globular plant proteins. The prevailing method that is used right now is twin screw high moisture extrusion, but 3D printing has emerged as a promising production method for 3D whole cut meats like steak. Uh, startups like Redefine Meat and Nova Meat are capitalizing on the huge investments in 3D printing technology and collateral industries to create a previously unimaginable generation of plant-based meats. Shear cell technology, uh, which is a, a novel mechanical process that allows for layering a fibrous vegetable protein is now being commercialized by Rival Foods, a spin out of Wageningen University, the world's top agricultural university. And, and actually some startups are eschewing mechanical processes altogether in favor of biological processes such as solid state fermentation, uh, which I'll hit on shortly. Although there is a lot happening there are still huge opportunities and white spaces along the value chain of plant-based uh, production, particularly in terms of helping transition our existing staples like soy, corn, and grains into better plant-based uh, products more consistently and at greater scale. And for the first time, we have a product widely available, at least in the US, uh, that shows, um, that studies show is a convincing alternative to its animal product counterpart, that is the Impossible Burger. 
However, even if products like the Impossible Burger proved to be quite faithful facsimiles of their animal product counterparts, there is some reason to believe that plant-based meats alone may never be able to fully replicate conventional meat products. Some people, inevitably, will still want the real thing. And that is where cultivated meat comes in. We can create the same meats that people love, but by thinking about the inputs and ingredients that go into meat at a molecular level. For those of you who this concept is relatively new, I'll very quickly explain what cultivated meat is. Uh, it's also called cultured meat, cell-based meat, in vitro meat, or clean meat. You might've heard those terms. Cultivating meat is a form of cellular agriculture where we, to oversimplify, take animal cells, bathe them in a soup of nutrients as they grow in number, then harvest the meat. Cultivated meat can provide the same sensory and nutritional experiences as conventional animal meat because it is comprised of the same cells. It's actual animal meat just grown outside of the body of an animal. At scale, it is produced in cultivators in much the same way as beers brewed or plants can be grown from a cutting. Uh, in a way, I like to think about it kind of like raising these nanoscale cows that just have different needs uh, in terms of how they're raised, but ultimately require the same inputs uh, at a molecular level for cell growth. Compared to con conventional beef, cultivated beef is expected to reduce land use by more than 95%, climate change emissions by up to 87% um, and curtail the risk of zoonotic disease, antibiotic disease, uh, dis resistance, and food contamination. Similar technology can be used to create cultivated leather, collagen, ivory, and other animal products, such as dairy produced through uh, mammalian mammary gland cells, like turtle tree labs. Since the first cultivated meat companies formed in 2015, the competitive landscape has grown with increasing speed, nearly doubling a number of established startups every year. This graphic provides a non-exhaustive sampling of companies in the space. By the end of 2019, 55 cultivated meat uh, and seafood industry startups spanning six continents had publicly announced themselves. There are now over 60 companies that appear to be primarily focused on cultivated meat production. Many companies like Merck and DSM are also pursuing cultivated meat as an additional business area. Most cultivated meat companies formed as vertically integrated businesses out of necessity, but there's now a burgeoning B2B ecosystem. The greatest opportunities for companies to get involved in cultivated meat are first cell line development, that is unlocking new animal species through cell isolation, immortalization, and biobanking. Second is cell culture media, which is the largest cost driver of production by improving the processes used uh, in biomedical tissue engineering media, just scaling it up and making it cheaper. Third is bioprocessing, so that would be improving the uh, process design, creating bioreactors and facilities. And fourth would be scaffolding or imparting 3D structure on these products, which remains uh, a problem. Companies are taking numerous approaches to doing that, including decellularized plants, texturized soy, uh, ferment fermentation-derived collagen, chitin from insects, mycelium, and nanotubes. But there's uh, more opportunity there as well. So the last category is fermentation, which is uh, another form of cellular agriculture. So what is fermentation? It has been used to mean various things in different contexts, but GFI employs a broad scope and defines fermentation as the use of single cell fungi, mycelium, bacteria, microalgae, and other microbes as a bioproduction platform to modify or produce proteins, fats, and other functional ingredients. Fermentation has a particularly long history in food production. Beer, leavened bread, tempeh, kimchi, and many ancient staples all exist thanks to rudimentary fermentation methods. In recent decades, modern technology has empowered these microbes to create functional food processing agents and ingredients like enzymes. For example, fermentation-derived trimacin has replaced rennet, which was formerly sourced from calf stomachs, as the primary coagulant in modern cheese production. Most people today are regularly consuming products that rely on fermentation. Regarding animal-free meat, British brand corn has been selling its fermentation-derived mycoprotein meats since the 1980s. It just wasn't until the last several years that many more pioneers entered the space. Fermentation technology is now being broadly applied to the alternative protein industry and is showing a tremendous amount of promise. GFI thinks of fermentation as fitting into three equally exciting categories. Traditional, biomass, and precision. Traditional fermentation refers to using intact live microorganisms to modulate and process plant-derived ingredients, resulting in products with unique flavor, nutritional profiles, and texture. 
Examples are using the fungus rhizopus to ferment soybeans into tempeh and various lactic acid bacteria to produce cheese. Next, biomass fermentation is used to produce standalone edible protein. Biomass fermentation leverages the fast growth and high protein content of many microorganisms to efficiently uh, produce large quantities of protein from various feedstocks like glucose, CO2, or agricultural waste. This biomass can then serve as the predominant ingredient of a food product. It can also serve uh, in the instance particularly of filamentous fungi or mycelium to provide 3D structure and other functionality to products, allowing plant-based products to go beyond ground formats like burgers to whole cuts like steak and bacon. Uh, lastly, persistent fermentation uses microbial hosts, often yeast or bacteria, as cell factories for producing specific functional ingredients that improve the sensory characteristics and functional attributes of the products that they are used in. Those ingredients can be proteins, enzymes, flavoring agents, vitamins, pigments, fats, uh, et cetera. Prominent examples include Perfect Day's dairy proteins being used for animal-free ice cream, as well as Impossible Foods heme flavor and colorant, which is produced in yeast with recombinant soy DNA. There are now 45 fermentation companies across the world dedicated to alternative protein applications, and another 23 companies identified with business lines in the space, including DuPont, Novozymes, and Lullamond. Fermentation really can be used to enable a new generation of proteins, fats, and other functional ingredients that enable biomimic whole cut meats, egg replacements, and animal free dairy proteins, fats, seafood products, and more. Uh, do, you, do you see what I mean with these pictures? All these products are actually uh, produced without animals. All these products were launched in the last year, and all these products are um, enabled by fermentation directly. So the greatest um, opportunities to get involved in fermentation are in end product formulation, bioprocess design and scale up, feedstock exploration and optimization, and target ingredient selection. So that wraps up the, the technology overview. And maybe this all sounds good in theory to you, but you're skeptical that the system really will fundamentally change. However, technologies uh, that are more efficient do have a history of changing the world rapidly. In 1892, the first gasoline power tractor was invented. In 1909, the Haber process for creating chemical fertilizer was developed. As a result of the newly technologically enabled industrialization of agriculture, we saw US farm population have from 64% in 1850 to 30% in 1920. It is now less than 1%. I mean, look to the phone that you're, you're probably checking email on right now. The existence of that kind of technology was not even in the public imagination. 20 or so years ago. We're in the midst of a new agricultural revolution, one that's leveraging both biotechnology and new agribusiness models that are likely to transform society as significantly as did the Haber process and the tractor. Some industry leaders even argue that we are in the midst of a second domestication akin to the agricultural domestication of crops and livestock that enabled large scale human civilization and economic specialization thousands of years ago. Domestication is defined as a sustained multi-generational relationship in which one group of organisms assumes a significant degree of influence over the reproduction and care of another group to secure a more predictable supply of resources from the domesticated group. Humans have domesticated pets like dogs for companionship, cloven animals like oxen for locomotion, but most importantly, and most recently, domesticated both plants and animals to pr provide a secure and reliable food source, what we call agriculture. A wild banana pictured is very different than what we eat. Um, we were able to harness the wild banana, uh, its potential and optimize it over generations with selective breeding. Like the banana, humans have also domesticated livestock to great effect. However, we are bumping up against what is physically possible to do with animals. The chicken is perhaps humanity's greatest feat in terms of domestication and optimization of an animal and production system to maximize meat per dollar and day. However, chickens are already at a point where they cannot live under the weight of their own breasts. Even as the most productive animal in terms of converting animal feed to meat, the chicken is reaching a thermo thermodynamic wall. It takes nine calories of feed in the form of soy wheat or legumes to get one calorie of food out of a chicken. The rest goes to feces, heat, eyeballs, feathers, and other low value byproducts of life. It's hard to imagine drastically improving that process 
without removing the need to defecate, keep itself warm, or grow feathers, kind of like what we're able to do with cultivated meat. We're reaching a point where we can domesticate a fungus to turn sawdust into steak, to turn carbon dioxide directly into protein. We can optimize peas to be turned directly into meat rather than funneled through animals. We can grow animal cells outside of the body of an animal and even have those cells produce beta carotene. This is the second domestication, a domestication of precision. We're using plants, microbes, and animal cells in an entirely different way, and we can use the suite of modern biotechnology technologies to control them more effectively than previously imagined. The generations of these species can span days or weeks, not years, and that accelerates our domestication timelines even faster. Now let's take a historical view on our relationship with animals um, and our use of animals for food and other technologies. Tractors removing mules and the like from land tilling and the hopper process removing animal manure from creating most fertilizer, fertilizers are not isolated incidents. There's a clear trend of new technologies arising and displacing uh, the use of animals. These innovations, which at the time were considered alternatives, are, were simply better and more efficient than their animal counterparts, such as was the case with transportation, sources of fuel, and even medicines. Automobiles replaced horses as primary movers, light bulbs replaced well oil lamps, and in 1982, Eli Lilly launched a yeast-based production platform for human insulin, which was previously purified from the pancreases of slaughtered pigs. The critical point here is that none of these transitions to non-animal technologies relied on fundamental sacrifices of the consumer or changes in consumer belief. In each case, the new technologies represented an undeniable optimization over the incumbent animal drive technology. This is a natural progression we've seen many times before. Uh, why would meat, eggs, or dairy be any different? I think that we are at the beginning of a change in the way that the $1.7 trillion animal agriculture industry produces its products. And there are opportunities all along the supply chain for pretty much any company to get involved. And I, I put some slides in here in case uh, Plug and Play is able to distribute those. You can look to those slides. So lastly, to where the rubber meets the road. That is, where are we now and what the traction is actually like uh, besides just frequent media headlines. So um, if you look to food service, you know, before 2019, there really wasn't that much. Uh, you know, in, in the U.S. change, there was a few rollouts of plant-based meat, like at Hardee's, but it wasn't until the Burger King's incredible success with the Impossible Whopper that we've seen kind of an exponential growth in food service offerings for plant-based. Uh, even with with KFC going so as far uh, as far as to uh, launch a plant-based chicken and even partner with a 3D printed cultivated meat startup to produce their chicken of the future. And uh, McDonald's is already launching a lot of products in other markets. And their CEO, Chris Kamsinski, uh, said on McDonald's US, quote, I certainly expect that over time, you will see plant-based on the McDonald's menu. I think for us, the question is really about when. So uh, food service has seen drastic success. Looking at retail sales um, in US, because that's what we have data for, the um, US retail market for plant-based food reached $5 billion in 2019 alone which was five times the growth of the broader food market. And if you look from the period 2017 to 2019, it was 28% uh, industry growth. The big players in the meat and food industry have taken notice. For example, of the top six meat companies in the US, all of them are active in plant-based meat through their own product lines or through investments. Tyson, Smithfield, JBS, Cargill, Hormel, and Conagra have all now developed plant-based meat and or blended products. Several meat companies are even rebranded as protein companies now. Turning to the largest food and beverage companies in the world, all of the top five either have either invested in a plant-based brand or developed their own. This is a massive shift that will boost sales growth in 2020 and beyond as these companies leverage their strength in distribution, manufacturing, and marketing. So here's another way to visualize the rapid growth of product launches. As you can see, for a long time, very little was happening uh, until... 2019, which appeared to be a tipping point for plant-based meat, and we expect that once these products start scanning in 2020 and beyond, that retail sales uh, is going to skyrocket. Um, established companies will have the opportunity to collaborate with the growing field of startups that are delivering waves of innovative new products. There are well over 300 startup companies in the plant-based meat, eggs, and dairy industry alone that GFI is tracking. 
Startups are able to innovate more rapidly and pursue more niche or riskier strategies than large corporations and are thus the first innovation in nearly all categories. We saw this in plant-based milk with brands like Silk, with beef burgers like Impossible Foods Beyond Meat and Corn, um, which were all once startups. We're now seeing the same pattern in emerging categories like eggs, ice cream, butter, seafood, chicken, pork, lamb, and other meats. And this is why a group like Plug and Play that help you connect your startups is so important. And very quickly, just looking at investments to show how early we are, but how fast things are moving. Venture capital uh, has grown rapidly across all alternative protein categories over the last decade, and in fact, tripled over the past three years. In the first half of 2020 alone, the amount of venture capital uh, surpassed um, $1.5 billion for the first time. And despite all this growth, much more investment is needed. Um, per pitch book, over 2.5 uh, $2.65 billion in venture capital went into U.S. cannabis companies alone, which is more than the entire alternative protein industry. And although the, uh, the amount of investment is relatively small, um, there are about 700 or 800 institutional investors um, in alternative protein companies, but com compare that with 5,800 in ag tech, according to PitchBook. Uh, it, it's still relatively early, but those investors do include some of the brightest minds, governments, and food companies. Um, so investors include Bill Gates, Richard Branson, Sergey Brin, Jeff Bezos, Y Combinator, SOSV, uh, a bunch of top professional venture capital firms, um, the governments of the US, Japan, EU, Israel, Canada, Singapore, and leading food companies like Danone, Kellogg's, General Mills, PHW, Tyson, Campbell's, Conagra, Dean Foods, Nestle, Unilever, et cetera. So I'll end with a couple of predictions on what the future holds. I know we're, we're close on time here. Ultimately, we don't see plant-based cultivated and fermentation technologies as being distinct, distinct industry se segments, but rather as kind of this continuum where we produce animal product alternatives across the spectrum. So a clear example of this is plant-based meat. Uh, the Impossible Burger is mostly plant-based, but uses fermentation to produce heme, the signature ingredient that gives it that bloody appearance and meaty taste that sets it apart. And in the future, we might have a plant-based burger that uses cultivated animal fat. We might use microbes to produce the growth factors that go into the cell culture media for that cultivated fat. We might ferment the whole thing to improve protein content. The possibilities are nearly endless. These hybrid approaches will reduce time to market and increase the diversity and functionality of product offerings. Secondly, I'll end by saying that pioneering innovators in the alternative protein industry have jump-started a virtuous cycle of product innovation consumer acquisition, investment, and scale production. We're now seeing an incredible number of scientists, entrepreneurs, and corporations developing innovative ingredients, production methods, and marketing strategies. GFI expects that the previously unimaginable amount of support behind and success of alternative proteins will only accelerate in the years to come. Thank you all for listening. For more of this kind of information, you can download GFI's free state of the industry reports on the three technology categories at gfi.org backslash industry. And uh, particularly if fermentation is of interest to you, GFI is hosting a free symposium on fermentation on Tuesday, October 20. So this coming Tuesday, which you can find more information at gfi.org backslash events. I will end my screen share. All right, thank you so much, Nate, uh, for that a very thorough uh, presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Zachary Rainey. I'm a Partnerships Manager here at Plug and Play. Uh, we're so happy to have you with us today. Uh, and uh, I would encourage you all, if you are interested in uh, what Nate presented, uh, uh, feel free to uh, follow, uh, follow up on that link that he shared at the end of his presentation. Thank you, Nate. Um, I just want to go ahead and get started today. We are kind of a running a tight ship, uh, so we have a lot of presentations going on. So just to get started, we're going to go ahead with day two. Uh, day two provides personalized nutrition with actionable insights for people to maintain normal blood sugar levels based on their microbiome. So please welcome Aaron from day two. Hi, my name is Aaron Del Duca, and I lead discovery initiatives at day two. And day two is a digital precision medicine company that's tackling metabolic disease using food as medicine. Today, we're going to talk about how people use our platform to balance their blood sugar and how we use the microbiome and machine learning to help the food industry personalize nutrition at scale. First, let's talk about diabetes. In order to take a bite out of it, we're going to have to let go of some of the prevailing paradigms in medicine. 
for example, nutritional recommendations are still based on whether or not a food measures up as healthy and presumes that anyone eating it will respond in the same way. The problem is that this is obviously false, but until now, we didn't really have the tools or technologies to work through this. Classic example, oatmeal, supposed to be a forbidden food for people with type 2 diabetes, right? Well, not exactly. While all four of our friends here have the same condition, they do not have the same metabolism. And as you can see, their blood sugar levels respond uniquely to the same food. And this is where day two comes in. Through eight years of pioneering research in conjunction with the Weizmann Institute in Israel, we enrolled thousands of individuals over a series of clinical trials and logged 50,000 meals, took millions of blood glucose measurements, and generated billions of data points from their microbiome samples. And with this, we trained an algorithm that can very accurately predict how an individual's blood sugar level will respond to a food item or combination of foods before they eat it. So here's how we use our technology uh, in real life. Back at the breakfast table, each of our friends punches oatmeal into the day two application. Mary's score is great, so she can eat it just as it is, but the rest of our friends need to make some adjustments. Based on each person's unique profile, our artificial intelligence recommends that Carl should add almonds, whereas Phil should add blueberries. And Brad ought to add peanut butter and bananas in order to bring his glycemic uh, response level back to a more reasonable level. Our business model is to take this program to self-insured employers, payers, and health systems. And I'm really happy to announce that we've very recently signed United Healthcare Group uh, as our most recent customer who opens us up to 55 million additional covered lives. Which leads me to my last example. Now that we have a platform of over 65,000 individuals, each characterized with microbiome information, nutritional information, we have a unique opportunity to look through the other end of the telescope here and use our knowledge base to help our corporate partners, many of whom are in the audience today, formulate better products, faster and cheaper, by optimizing in silico. Partners would be able to select a test cohort of individuals from our user our knowledge base based on demographic or biomedical information of interest. They can upload um, some uh, nutritional information on the product formulation that they're, they're working on. And day two would be able to return population level insights as well as science-backed recommendations on how to dial that formulation in. With increasing pressure to reduce glycemic index and launch cleaner labels and functional foods, day two is uniquely positioned to catapult this process into the future. Join us. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, so our next startup will be uh, Stinco. Stinco has oxygen barrier properties better than most plastics and has a low cost of production. So please welcome John from Stinco. Hello, my name is John Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of Stinco. First, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to have been a part of this year's plug and play program. It's been a pleasure to have interacted with many of you over the past few months. It is truly an honor. So we have a problem. The raw tonnage of plastic being created is hard to even imagine. Put into perspective, 300 million tons would be the mass of 6 million semi-truckloads every year. Sadly, a significant amount of it makes its way into our environment and oceans. Single-use plastics are more than half of that number. We depend on them to keep our food fresh, our supply chains efficient, and it's so convenient. We're all just kicking the can to our ancestors, and as it will be a problem still, in 10,000 years. But what can we do about it? There are many biodegradable options on the market, but most of them are unsuitable to the task at hand. Against that backdrop, Stenco went to work. We use nature and good old fashioned polymer chemistry to create a platform technology we call the Stenco system. This barrier coating can be applied to paper or other substrates as a packaging barrier to form a stout chemical oxygen barrier that may be customized to a variety of applications. We designed it to be stable, safe, and based on nature's own chemistry. Easily applied and inexpensive, it degrades in the same way as cellulose, naturally. At Stenco, we believe that data speaks louder than words. Our OTR values are beyond many established barrier films that are in everyday use already. As scientists and using our novel approach, we found a lot of green space around our ideas. As entrepreneurs, we patented it. 
At the heart of it, and more to the point, we are a technology provider and expect to license our IP. Let us put our experience in chemistry to work for you. We have experience and know-how to customize this product to meet your KPIs. Give us your problem, we will work with you to find a solution. The markets are huge. Everyone listening has likely used hundreds of single-use plastic items that can be candidates for our product. We've prototyped some of these already and are looking to expand that list very soon with the right partners. For a coffee pod application, we developed a formulation with some of the more aggressive targets imaginable. We're truly excited about the potential that this is showing. There are options out there right now to take petroleum-based plastics that are suffocating our planet. This time, the time is right to take big steps for the sake of our children. Compare us, please. You will not be disappointed. For those of you that we have talked to and we continue to speak with, thank you. For those of you with sustainability goals, we look forward to engaging with you. We are proud to be where we are and have parlayed a modest amount of investment into what you see here today. Our next steps are even bigger. If you're interested in participating in Stenco's future, we'd love to talk with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, John. Our next startup, MyAir, creates a functional uh, personal superfood for stress management. Please welcome Rachel from MyAir. Hi. You know, many people don't talk about it, but unfortunately, too many people are dying from it. Stress is the global silent killer. For the past 20 years, I had a stressful career as VP Marketing at Tiva, the leading pharma company, and the CEO of the snacks division at Nestle, the leading food corporate. In fact, as a business leader and executive manager, stress has become a massive burden in my life. Stress is number six killer factor. 75% of the adult population in the US has reported suffering from chronic stress, and the cost of stress to the US industry is $300 billion. I tried to manage my stress through medication, meditation, mindfulness, but I failed to maintain stress stressless management into my routine until I understood that the change in behavior is so complex, but there is one thing that we all have to do, eating. In a world where we manage our diet or manage our sports routine, it is essential that we will start to manage our stress and personal nutrition is part of the solution. We are MyAir, a functional food company specializing in personal stress management. Imagine once a month, you get a box into your doorstep with your name on it. In the box, you will find a set of tasty and healthy nutrition bars made with a mixture of active super plants. Those super plants are proven to reduce stress and tailored to your specific profile. Well, the truth is that there is no need to imagine because for the past few weeks, we had the privilege to deliver those exact solutions to hundreds of consumers all across the US. And the feedback was behind our wildest dreams. Last week, I got those text messages from our consumers. Actually, we were not surprised to get this feedback because the research results on our pr pr products were that 72% of users demonstrated positive effect after eating our super bars. Plants are the world's first technology, and we believe in food that works for me. Our proprietary formulations are based on plants-based molecules proven to reduce stress. Our super plants can support the body's natural ability to heal stress through the endocrine and autonomic nervous system. When talking about stress, one size does not fit all. Stress affects me mainly at night on my sleep, but stress affects one of our users mainly in the morning on his energy levels. Chronic stress might create focus problems or muscle tension. One size does not fit all. So the next question would be, how should I know which nutrition bar I need to eat? Well, luckily, we live in the age of big data. And through our research on stress, we were able to develop a super smart patent pending algorithm based on AI technology. Through any smartwatch, we analyze physiological data and combine, combine it with psychological data through cognitive assessment. That unique combination of mind and body creates the best profiling. Since stress is an ongoing problem, we offer an ongoing solution. Our subscription model offers a wellness routine based on personalized, long-term, ongoing data. Stress is not my only personal problem. It's also the biggest global silent killer, and personal nutrition is part of the solution. We invite you to join our Superfood for Mood journey. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Our next startup, Shidu, uh, leverages ma machine learning and precision biology to identify and create ideal food proteins to feed people's sustainability. So please welcome Jasmine from Shidu. Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine Hume and I'm the founder and CEO of Shiru. At Shiru, our mission is to feed people more sustainably. We do that by leveraging machine learning and precision biology to be able to identify and create ideal food proteins. I founded the company last year in 2019 and our headquarters is in Emeryville, California. Here are some examples of how we engage with our customers at Shiru. On the left is an example of a company that's currently making meat alternatives. They rely very heavily on egg protein as a binding ingredient in their formulations. They're currently evaluating our first gelation protein ingredient to be able to replace egg as a binding ingredient in their uh, products. On the right is another example of a company that's uh, also evaluating the same ingredient. They wanna make a vegan yogurt alternative under their brand. Interestingly, Shiru's identifying ingredients that are specifically very functional, and so they can be uh, used to replace ingredients such as egg protein or dairy proteins. How do we do this? At Shiru, we use an iterative, iterative approach to identify the best natural proteins via machine learning. It's essentially a, a three-step process. First, we discover proteins that have ideal structures computationally by using machine learning and other proprietary algorithms. Second, the proteins that we've predicted to be functional through these algorithms, we create in the lab. We do this by expressing these proteins recombinantly through fermentation. Thirdly, we then validate those proteins, making sure that they actually demonstrate the functionality that we were screening for to begin with. What results from that third step is two things. One, all of the data that was generated in that process that helps our machine learning methods get better and better and also identifying the products that are very functional that we want to scale and develop into ingredients. We intend to bring our products to market by two potential paths. The first is through expression in microorganisms, which is a more near-term goal. Longer term, we also expect that these proteins can be expressed heterologously in crops. We have a great team at Shiru that consists of experts in machine learning, computational biology, and of course, proteins and protein chemistry. We're backed by world-class investors. Last year, we went through Y Combinator, raising our pre-seed, uh, followed by closing our seed round in October of 2019, where we raised $3.5 million, led by Lux Capital with participation from S2G, CPT, and another, a number of other prominent VCs. We're really excited to talk to you about partnering uh, and helping us bring these, uh, to, to bring these ingredients to market to help you continue to innovate and make great food products. Please reach out to me if you're interested in discussing potential collaborations. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Our next startup, Turtle Tree, is the first biotech company to create milk sustainably using cell-based tech. Please welcome Fingru from Turtle Tree. Hi, everyone. My name is Fengru. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Turtle Tree Labs. See, getting milk from cows is going to be a thing of the past. We're the first biotech company in the world that is able to use cell-based technology to create full milk. This is a game changer. Milk is by far the largest food segment in the world. We're talking about a $700 billion industry that will one day be using this technology to source raw milk. We know that cattle farming isn't sustainable and produces 37% of global methane emissions. Plant-based products are great, but don't have the full functionality of raw milk. We can harness the power of cell-based technology to create milk that is clean, fresh, and free from antibiotics. Being functional means being able to make cheese, butter, cream, or yogurt. So how does our technology work? We start with cells that we can get right from fresh milk. We multiply these cells, then put them in our special lactation media. The cells will then convert the lactation media into milk. What's really special is that our cells are not consumed in the whole process. They are a factory that makes milk, and our end product is free from cells. Using our licensing and royalty model, we will be working with existing equipment manufacturers on our bioreactor design. Mm -hmm. Our team will work with dairy producers and consumer brands to co-develop products for consumers. Like the Intel Insight model, 
we can envision our logo on every dairy product globally. We started in January, January 2019 with several scientists and filed our provisional patents after we made some breakthroughs. Fast forward through 2020, we have now raised our seed funding and began customer engagement with major brands that account for 22% of the global dairy market. Recently, we're honored to be awarded the winner of the 2020 Tomasic Livability Challenge. Our focus now is on our bioreactor design and scaling up our production. Learning from successful global companies, our licensing and royalty model allows us to scale quickly and become profitable much faster. Upfront licensing fees allows us to bring in revenue early on during product development with our partners and royalties will have exponential returns. Our executive team consists of myself, Max, the chief strategist, Dr. Jen, our CTO, and Dr. John, our CIO. As pioneers in this tech, we can produce milk from many other mammals like goats, sheep, camels, and so much more. One of our biggest interests that we've seen from industry is our work on human milk because it has the potential to transform the entire infant nutrition industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fingru. Our next startup, Yoren Imaging, uh, is in, uh, introducing Industry 4.0 to the heat ceiling arena. Please welcome Aaron from Yoren Imaging. Hello, everyone. My name is Eran Sinbar. I'm the CEO of Yoran Imaging from Israel. We are introducing Industry 4.0 into the heat ceiling arena. The heat ceiling arena is a huge industry which uh, in includes the food, the cosmetics, the pharma, the medical device, and the consumer goods. You can see here some packages, either there are cups, pouches, maybe sachets, maybe tubes, blisters. They, they, they protect on the, on the product from the outside environment. This is the critical primary package, and it is most of the time sealed by heat. The anomaly that we have noticed is that the production is done by very advanced automation machineries, but the way it is being tested is very primitive. It's done by sampling, by destructive means. It's not inline, it's offline. It's a pathological test, and we understand that there it's just not good enough. There is a need for inline automation industry for standard uh, testing to make sure that the ceiling integrity is the, in the required standards. We have developed based on our over 20 years of experience in thermal imaging a system that can control thermal cameras that can see the heat, see the heat pattern and apply artificial intelligence in inline very fast without slowing down the production line and can see if the product is well sealed or not. You can see here an image of a yogurt cup on the, on the top, you can see it green when it is well sealed and on the bottom you can see that there is a sealing issue. This is what we see with our advanced thermal imaging. You can see a potato chips pouch passing underneath a thermal camera, it's connected to our system. You can see on the left hand side, it looks like a 3D image third dimension is the heat pattern. We can see the all three ceiling lines and we can see if it is well sealed or not. If it will not, if it's not well sealed, we will reject the product. One of our main advantage is that we can also analyze the big data. You can see on the left hand side data where there is pro product in the ceiling line and you can, every point is a product. You can see all the analytical uh, statistics about this production time of the night shift. And this gives a, a control and ability to control the process, to alert the trend on time, to reduce waste of the plastic, of the aluminum, of the packages and the food itself, and to prevent from products that are unsealed to reach the market. We have already started to sell our products. We have a market penetration in Israel of the tier one industries. Some of them are multinational like Nestle and PepsiCo. And we have also uh, signed NDAs with international companies like Lavazza, Mars, Marcus, Unilever, and also with the huge machinery manufacturers, Tetra Pak. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aaron. Our next startup, Pasadonia, helps reduce salt while keeping taste. Pasadonia is 100% natural sea salt that only contains 8% sodium. You're going to have to explain that one to me. Go ahead, Arnold from Pasadonia. Hi, guys. I'm Arnold from Pasadonia, and I just would like to explain to you how we're going to revolute the food sector with this product, a natural low-sodium salt. As you know, salt is really bad. You have salt in everything and everywhere. And just following the WHO, 4.2 million people are dying every year just because of the salt consumption. We should eat, on average, eat maximum 5 grams of salt per day, but today we all eat more than 10 grams of salt per day. And only in the U.S., more than 100 million people are suffering from ARP attention, which is a huge number. Another fact is that 80% of the salt that we consume uh, comes from processed food. First of all, from bread, then from meat, from cheese, from ready meals, uh, from soups and sauces. Um, and now today, when you want to reduce the salt, you have three ways of doing that. First of all, is less salt, but less salt is less taste. Then you have a well-known product, a chemical product called the potassium chloride. But what's the problem with that is that you have a bad taste, a metallic taste, and then it's also not supported by health professionals. And then the third way of doing that is using Poseidonia, a natural product. So what do we do and who we are? Uh, we are actually 100% natural uh, sea salt with exactly the same taste as salt but five times less sodium so only eight percent sodium which is unique what is our secret it's actually the place where we produce our salt so here you have the island of formentera in spain a beautiful place where i hope that i can bring you all the next time and around these islands you have the biggest world reserve of, of a plant called the posidonia oceanica and thanks to this plant we can produce this unique salt now today we are working with plenty of retailers uh, in Europe and food manufacturers such as Carrefour, such as La Lorraine, such as Deleuze. So each time in bread, meat, cheese uh, or salmon, we are even working with Piratos um, and we are presented as their solution uh, for the salt reduction. Uh, and in the US, we are also working with Arista, which is baking one bread for Starbucks in the US. So you see there are plenty of opportunities and we really would like to see what we can do uh, for you guys. Here you have, for example, uh, example of marketing campaigns done by Carrefour in Belgium on the left and in Spain on the right. So TV ads just explaining minus 25% salt, exactly the same taste thanks to Posidonia salt. So now guys, it's up to you. Uh, you see the market is huge and we really would like to uh, work together and see what we can do with you to innovate and build the best product ever. So please do not hesitate to contact us and I wish you a really, really good day. Bye. Thank you so much, Arnold. Uh, just a quick reminder for all of the uh, participants in our chat today, as well as our corporate uh, partners, our mentors, we will be having a Remo session after this. So hold all of your questions uh, for that period and we'll be happy to have those facilitated uh, during that session. Our next startup, Biotip, has developed freshness stickers, an IP protected technology that changes color exactly when a product spoils. So please welcome Zer from Biotip. When you go to the supermarket and want to buy a product from the fridge, like milk. The expiration date should tell you whether the milk is fresh or not. Is it really like that? The freshness status is affected by the initial bacterial count and the temperature it was exposed to. However, it's impossible to know what exactly happened to the milk from the moment it left the factory until we drink it. Thus, expiration date has no ability to really tell us the quality of the foods that we eat. As a result, tens of billions of dollars are wasted due to the inaccurate expiration date. This challenge disturbs the industry for a long time. At the producer level, solutions such as Time Temperature Indicators, TTI, only indicate on the amount of temperature that the food was exposed to, but not on the freshness status of the food. In addition, they are relatively expensive. At Biotip, we provide the ultimate solution, spoilage equally occur in the product and in the sticker, which essentially is its biological twin. Unlike other, we indicate on spoilage and not only on temperature exposure, 
we develop a solution that measures and not only assume freshness status of the food. To apply this, simple existing machinery is needed. All this pleasure costs only one cent per product, including depreciation, labor, and materials. Freshness stickers bring huge value to the industry, starting with making the products more reliable, increasing the trust between the producers, distributors, and consumers, improve corporate social responsibility. All this together will increase market share. Considering all relevant product, we estimated a total market of tens of billions of dollars. Let me tell you a little bit where we stand. Company funded by us, the founders. We got grant from the Israel Innovation Authority. At the moment, technology development is completed and we establish a prototype at semi-industrial scale in our lab. The technology is patented worldwide. We recently were selected by the European Union EIT Food and currently targeted to engage commercial agreement in Europe accompanied by, me by mentors from Danone and Pasquale. We signed agreement with Israeli largest diary, Tnuva, which opens a door also to the Chinese market. Our team combines strong scientific expertise in physical chemistry, microbiology, and food tech. Experience biz dev, finance, and accompanied by a leading legal firm. We invite you to make a pilot with us, test our technology, and make it valuable for you. Thank you, Biotip. Our next uh, startup, Algama uh, Foods, aims to harvest the unique potential of microalgae by integrating them into our daily food products. Please welcome Pascal from Algama Foods. Hi, everybody. My name is Pascal Lanchamp, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Algama. With Algama, we recognize, like everybody else, that the future of food is plant-based. But we have taken a different direction than everybody else uh, since we have focus on algae. And the reason why we have focus on algae is because it has a very high density uh, in proteins, and these proteins contain all the essential amino acids. So it's a very uh, sustainable way of producing your food and incorporating it into the food and beverage matrices. Around that, we have created a company called Algama back in 2013. We are headquartered in Paris and we have offices in New York. And basically, we have developed technologies, formulation, ingredients, and also end product around algae. All of these products that you see on this slide are made out of algae. And by now, we can offer egg replacement, which is our brand Tamalga for B2B. We have a seafood alternative, a dairy replacement, milk replacement, and also a chocolate and a beverage called Spring Wave around phycocyanin, which is a naturally blue color. So the first uh, product uh, is uh, Tamalga, and this is an egg replacer, replacer for replacement of full egg for the dressing or baking application. It's a B2B product, so it's premixes which are offered to industry so that they can realize their own product. We have used our Tamalga uh, B2B premix to actually make a vegan mayonnaise. So this is a mayonnaise with no eggs. And we have launched it with under the brand name It's a Good Spoon in major retailers in France and also on the web. It contains 60% less fat and calories than normal uh, mayonnaise and for sure no eggs. So in terms of production capacity of Tamalga, we have looked at it uh, very uh, carefully because we want it to be uh, at scale and it's a scale which corresponds to the food and beverage industry. So we can produce eight tons per day of Tamalga as of now, and we can quadruple that very easily. We have Spring Wave, which is a naturally blue drink, uh, and it is made out of phycocyanin and it contains no preservatives thanks to a patent that we earn on the process. Working with us, we have a, a business model which is B2B, uh, providing premix to the industry and we collaborate with the industry to make products, offer our solutions or even create novel products for the industry. So please come and taste our products, they are excellent.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal. Our next startup, Talking Things, is a smart packaging one-stop shop for brands to benefit uh, from connecting products throughout the entire supply chain. Uh, please welcome Jacek from Talking Things. Hi there, I'm Jacek Terski from Talking Things. Today, I will have a privilege to present you a solution for food industry. Let's dive into details. Talking Things is a one-stop shop for smart packaging. We provide full set of services and components to make FMCG products connected. To keep the implementation convenient for our clients, we deliver RFID and NFC tags inserted in ready-to-apply labels together with hardware and software to identify products through whole supply chain, from production to consumer. Since 2019, we have raised 6.5 million from VC. Our solutions were successfully delivered to global companies across various industries, food, beverage, pharma, wine and spirits, and other. We truly believe in the future of RFID and NFC in FMCG industry. Research by Accenture Strategy shows that one of the top business pressures to implement RFID is improvement of operating profits. And companies benefit from implementation of RFID technology in their facilities and on their products. 98% of RFID adopters reported an ROI of at least 5% for at least one use case. NFC is part of RFID family and it has been recently introduced to the market by Talking Things in a revolutionary pricing of three cents. It carries a bunch of opportunities for food, FMCG and pharma, especially in increasing of granularity of collected data and allows for consumer communication. Even Apple decided to focus more on NFC and helps to build consumer awareness. New iOS 14 enables native scanning even for older iPhones, starting from iPhone 7. Talking Things helps our customers to build a reliable solution that matches consumer communication and track and trace down to product single unit. In food industry, ensuring customers on genuineness and freshness of purchased products is very important. This solution helps also to reduce food waste with automatic scanning and checking expiration dates at retail stage. But this is not where connected products' life ends. It allows for creation of bridge between physical and digital, like allowing consumer to reorder product by redirecting to e-commerce. Thanks to our investment in the most modern RFID and NFC manufacturing line based in Central Europe, we are able to deliver a 3 cent NFC tag now with a roadmap to go down with the price to 1 cent in 2025. NFC tax has been never been more affordable and we truly believe this enables most of food and FMCG products to become a connected ones. Today, I would like to invite you to become an NFC adopter with support of Talking Things to get unprecedented competitive advantage and be innovator and leader in your category. Thank you. All right, thank you, ASIC. Uh, our next startup, Microfit, uh, is a biotechnology innovator with a focus on discovering, developing, and producing natural bioactives derived from mycoalgae. Please welcome Vincent from Michael. Hi, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you for giving me your time and listening to me today. Sincerely, thank you. So I'm going to introduce myself. And David, I'm the marketing manager, and I'm very proud to represent all the employees of Microfit. Microfit is a French startup, and we develop, produce, and market microalgae ingredients that will make all difference for you in the market. What do we do? We help to transition food supplement and cosmetic industries to using unique natural ingredients. Microalgae are among the very first form of life on Earth. They are very small unicellular plants that are the natural factories of modern nature. Antioxidants, omega-3, proteins, and so on are naturally produced, and microalgae make them available for us in their natural, highly bioavailable form. How do we support the transition to natural ingredients? We created a unique patented photo bioreactor technology. This technology allows us to produce microalgae like none of the existing competitors. They are naturally made, non-GMOs guaranteed, 
totally renewable, traceable, and cost effective. The quality of our production is unmatched, and we generate a renewable and sustainable source of nutrients. Our expertise is unique on a world stage. The current market of natural ingredients from microalgae relies on only two or three species. The other company capable of producing microalgae won't be able to grow new species in a short time frame. Our technology can do it, and we have already proved it. Our first plastic product is BrainFit. This offers full support of cognitive function in a totally natural and sustainable way. BrainFit is so promising that we decided to take it to clinical trials. The company completed seven successful preclinical studies that showed that BrainFit increases significantly many types of memory like recognition memory. The potential market is huge and growing to booming customer demographic, for example, elderly, which will be 72 million in the US in 2030. The cognitive food supplement market represented about $6 billion globally and $2 billion in the US in 2018. The target consumer of cognitive health products is valued as elderly, young professionals, athletes, or e gamers. To continue penetrating the market, we can count on our expert team. The company count among its employees 16% PhDs, 40% Master of Science in Food, Chemistry, Biotechnology, and Microbiology. This expertise enables us to offer various types of products for two portfolios. Our food supplement portfolio gathers natural preventative ingredients to target segments like cognitive well-being and as well joint, liver, or diabetes health. Meanwhile, our cosmetics portfolio is focused on skincare. We are now looking for partners to develop our business beyond dietary supplements, specifically into, a, into food and beverage. We are open to regional partnership targeting Asia. We are passionately committed to bring microalgae based innovation to your customers. Do you want to be a part of the transition to the natural? Thank you so much. Uh, our next startup, LifeNome, is an award winning precision AI platform for personalizing health and wellness products, programs, and services. I actually had the pleasure of seeing them uh, present in Japan as well. Please welcome Ali from LifeNome. Hi, my name is Dr. Ali Masashar. I am the CEO of LifeNome, a precision nutrition and health AI company headquartered in New York City. LifeNome was co-founded by three uh, scientists, uh, each in their top 25 cited scholars in the fields of complexity science, computational genomics, and semantic networks. Um, we have more than $28 million in deals lined up in, for the next uh, five or six years, and we would like uh, to add uh, your business to ours. Um, in terms of partnerships, we have partnerships with some of the major brands in the world. Uh, together, our clients have uh, more than $500 billion in market capital, and we have received industry recognition such as being the World Economic Forum's Global Innovator and Zurich um, World Championship in um, Innovations um, Global Winner. Um, as we know, the future of uh, nutrition is becoming more and more personalized, and by 2025, we expect that there's going to be $1.3 billion opportunity in precise nutrition and precision nutrition. Uh, what we do is we take in data from individuals in, in, the, say, in the form of a precision profile that includes biological data such as DNA and microbiome, um, physiological data such as wearables and medical history, lifestyle data such as behaviors and preferences, and at the end, environmental data in order to be able to provide um, precision assessments of what the person's nutritional needs would be, ingredient sensitivities, any chronic disease predispositions, and their metabolism, uh, provide recommendations on weight loss programs, uh, chronic disease prevention programs, healthy aging programs, and programs to boost the immune system, as well as personalizing supplements, groceries and food products, snacks, beverages, meals and bars, and um, food menus and meal kits. Uh, in particular, for our partners in the plug and play uh, food tech um, uh, batch, we would like to provide a pilot uh, that allows individual companies to test out our platform for around 250 users 
for a total of $49,000, including DNA testing, DNA-based health assessments, a three-month precision nutrition program, and um, the ability to have the client's products and recipes integrated into the recommender. Um, and of course, as a company that deals with data, we care a lot about privacy and we're compliant with all the major international laws on uh, user privacy um, and security. Thank you very much. Thank you, LifeNome. Uh, our next startup, Turning Labs, is an R&D digital transformation platform uh, that top global CPGs trust. They evaluate and optimize R&D outcomes uh, all in one place faster than ever. So please welcome Manmit from Turning Labs. Hi, I'm Manmit Shemali. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Turing Labs. And Turing is the fastest way to develop product formulations. 1950 was the first time Tide was launched. Today, there are 53 products doing the same thing. The point being, consumer needs are changing extremely fast in today's highly competitive world, and you have to meet those needs. But you know, it's extremely hard to develop better products. Today, it takes months, if not years, and millions of dollars to configure optimal product from ingredients to packaging to claims, and you have to go through the stage gate process and when you do that, you realize that your product was not good enough to win over the competition, or you are too late in the market. What is this better way to do it? What if you can develop better product formulations 10 times faster with 50% less cost and improve the odds of developing more successful products? That's what we do. Turing Build for CPG is a software that helps you to innovate better products across development stages virtually and instantly. The way we do that is we take your data, we provide you with a software that can help you to assess your formulation hypothesis instantly and also helps you to know how your consumers will react even before you have built the product. We build the entire workflow and the AI just for CPG data and your stage gate process. That's why we are the fastest and the most accurate when you compare us with generic ML company whose algorithms never work for complex sparse CPG data. We are extremely faster than the consulting company and we have a workflow built for CPGs versus a generic Microsoft or you know Azure kind of a workflow. Our model, our software has been loved by top CPG companies in the world, including the fourth largest CPG in the world, one of the top 10 food company and fifth largest retailer on the planet. Recently, we had a fantastic win. We saved $6.7 million in R&D and consumer insights cost, reduced time to commercialization from months to just a few weeks, helped the team to assess hundreds of formulations instantly with 91% accuracy, and recommended three products formulations one of them is already in the market. And the reason we are able to do that is because we have built the database, we have the AI just built for CPG. Our team is very strong. We have founders uh, with years and years of experience in CPG, and we are backed by Y Combinator and top Silicon Valley investors. So if you wish to speed up your product development by 70%, leverage your assets to gain your company advantage and innovate better products, come and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mehmet. Uh, our next startup, Edamam, uh, provides nutrition solutions to businesses in the food, health, and wellness sectors by leveraging its cloud-based structures. So please welcome Victor from Edamam. Hello, I'm Victor Panet, founder of Edamam. Edamam's mission is to organize the world's food knowledge so we can give it back to people and help them make smart food choices and ultimately live healthier and happier lives. Very early on, we recognized that to have the most impact, we have to make, meet people where they make their food choices, at grocery stores and restaurants, dietitian offices, and corporate wellness programs. So we set ourselves the goal to become the nutrition data engine behind every food, health, and wellness business in the world. And we are well on our way with brands like Nestle, Amazon, Food Network, trusting our data and solutions. So how do they use us? Nestle, for example, builds applications and websites for healthy eating across the world, and they use our data to provide the meal recommendations in those applications. Borilla uses us to do the nutrition analysis of all recipes that contain their branded products. McCormick leverages two of our APIs for internal product development and to manage their data. 
and we are growing fast with over 200 active deals in my pipeline, including the likes of CVS, Kroger, and Kaiser Permanente. We also have over 60,000 subscribers to our API, and we are going to exceed 70,000 before the end of 2020. Of course, there are many companies that offer similar services, anyone from nutrition API, such as Nutrition Extends Punacular, to food data sets like All Recipes in Yamli, to all hands in nutrition data like Asha. But what differentiates us is that we provide value-added services such as nutrition analysis and meal recommendations at a fraction of the cost of what currently exists. What really helps us stand out is our human level accuracy, which is leveraging a proprietary natural language understanding for the food domain and nutrition analysis algorithms that we've built over the years. We also have assembled probably the largest and the deepest data set of meals in the world with over 5 million recipes and 800,000 foods all tagged and analyzed for every nutrient, every allergen, every diet, and every chronic condition. We are also very affordable with our API starting at only $29 a month. Here's a quick look at the services that we offer, anything from nutrition analysis and meal recommendations to food database lookup and recipe licensing. So how does this end up being a business? We estimate that the worldwide market for nutrition data is over $20 billion a year, 5 billion just in the US. Last year, we ended up, ended up with 635,000 in annualized run rate, and we are already profitable. We also have the team to execute. I myself am a serial entrepreneur and have started and sold Bulgaria's largest internet company. The other people on the leadership team have decades of building and startups and growing them. And our engineering team is comprised of A-plus engineers with decades in AI, semantic technology, building search engines, and software architecture. As we embark on our next stage, we're looking to raise three million to accelerate our growth, both for product expansion, geographic expansion, and growing our team. Moreover, we're looking for partners that will help us expand our solutions and build out our capabilities. We're looking for teams and people to help to realize our goal, to feed everybody on the planet and help them eat better. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Victor. Uh, last but not least on our startup agenda today uh, will be Paragon. Uh, they aim to understand the science of nature to create genuine ingredients for delivering natural flavors, colors, and nutrients uh, for wholesome foods. So please welcome Chris from Paragon. Hello. My name is Chris Gregson, CEO of Paragon Pure. We protect delicious naturally. Consumers want foods made with real food ingredients. They're increasingly rejecting additives like modified starch, maltodextrin, and gums. And they're willing to pay more for consumer-friendly alternatives. However, in many cases, there are no suitable replacements. To answer this need, we developed precision sprouting, a technique that uses nature and the traditional sprouting process to enhance the performance of whole grains by finally con controlling the natural enzymatic processes to create specialty flours with exactly the properties we need. With this process, we create real food ingredients that replace synthetic additives. It enables clean label encapsulation to protect sensitive natural ingredients like lime oil and beet juice. And it can provide alternatives for maltodextrin and starch hydrosylates. This is a consumer friendly solution and it fits with an existing supply chain infrastructure. It's also a more sustainable, minimal processing approach with improved carbon footprint, less waste and higher yield. There are many applications for these high performance real food ingredients, including breakfast cereals, bakery blends and snack foods. We're targeting a $34 billion addressable market that includes encapsulation solutions, food powders and replacements for starch derivatives. Partnering with leading ingredient suppliers enables high gross margin revenue potential of over $200 million. Our business model is to license our technology to ingredient suppliers. These are companies that aim to provide the clean label ingredients that food manufacturers need to make consumer friendly foods. The model is repeatable and we have a pipeline of projects for future innovations. The runway for meaningful revenues is about two years, after which revenue growth will be rapid and further accelerated as we expand to new ingredient segments and build additional technologies. Technologies in this space are extremely sticky with recurring sales that can last decades. We expect high gross margin revenues of about $8 million by 2023, growing to $50 million by 2025. Since Paragon Pure was founded in 2019, 
we have achieved significant traction. Three patent applications have been filed and we've conducted several proof of concept trials with major ingredient suppliers. Our next step is to drive these partnerships to commercialization via joint development agreements. We're a team of industry insiders with decades of innovation and commercialization experience. We use precision sprouting to create high performance, real food ingredients. So if you're an ingredient supplier looking for differentiated technology, a food manufacturer wanting consumer friendly ingredients, or an investor searching for a great seed funding opportunity, we'd love to talk with you. You can email me directly or visit our table at the Plug and Play Fall Summit Expo Remo event. We'd love for you to join us on our quest to protect delicious naturally. All right, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, that concludes our startup pitch uh, presentation portion of our day today. So uh, now we're going to move on to our corporate award ceremony. So we, um, uh, each year, um, uh, especially during the batch, we, um, we wrap up the uh, end of the startup presentations with some awards for our corporate partners, our mentors, and our startups that participated in the batch. Uh, for our corporate a partnership award, we select a partner we believe is engaging with our startups, our programs, and extracting as much value as they can out of our ecosystem as possible. So this year, our corporate award winner for the fall batch goes to... Ocean Spray Cranberries. Ocean Spray was founded in 1930 and is an American agricultural cooperative of over 700 cranberry growers in North and South America. Since joining our program in October of 2019, they have signed over 20 NDAs. They have nine POCs in the pipeline, one of them being Intello Labs that had immediate applicable use to Ocean Spray's receiving station challenge and has already done five deal flows this year with the sixth one being earmarked for November. I'm happy to hand over the mic to Josh Wiseman, strategic in, uh, he's in strategic innovation over at Ocean Spray. Josh, go ahead and take it away. Hey, thanks, Zach. First off, I, I have to thank the plug and play team for this rec recognition. Uh, our success is not only a reflection of how much we've enjoyed the partnership, but also the quality and integrity of your organization. Specifically, I have to extend a huge thank you to Yuki, who's our fantastic coordinator of chaos. Uh, her patience, her diligence with us, and her energy is just always amazing. While I'm here accepting this award on behalf of my team, it's really my team that deserves all the praise and recognition here. They are the real superheroes that drive our work forward. Specifically, Steve Charles, Steve Nojime, Katie Latimer, Christina Ku, Jamie Glyden, and of course, our CTO, Rizal Hamdallah. You know, it's funny, Zach, and everyone, as I reflected on the stats mentioned earlier regarding our engagement, what really got me the most excited was not what we've accomplished to date, but rather what's in store for the future with you guys. It, this brings me to my last thank you. Thank you to all of you, the entrepreneurs. It takes a uniquely amazing person to do what you guys are doing. As some of you may know, prior to joining Ocean Spray, I actually lived almost exclusively in the startup world as a CEO, founder, and co-founder. And as we know, while the media picks up on all of our successful fundings, the product launches we have, the massive revenue milestones, it's often the stories of rejection or hard times and our failures that truly define us and our companies. Without your grit, your determination, your perseverance, and your never quit energy, we would have no deal flow. We'd have no programs to pilot and we would have no activations. And while we can't work and collaborate with everyone, we certainly respect and appreciate everyone. So a huge thank you from myself and the entire team at Ocean Spray, uh, and can't wait to see what this year has in store. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, and that's actually a fantastic segue into our next award, which would be our uh, Startup Awards uh, uh, winner. So um, on the same line, uh, we select the winner for this award based on our startup's engagement within the batch. Uh, this, this startup was believed to be the most successful in working with our partners and, and being the most active in our program. Uh, I'm sure you all know where I'm going with this. So our uh, startup winner for the fall batch is... Stinco. Stinco has participated in several of our programs throughout their stint at Plug and Play. They have executed a handful of DN, uh, NDAs, POCs, and mentorship, uh, mentorship sessions, and are currently in negotiations for partnerships with a few companies. We're happy that, uh, with their successes, and we hope that they continue their momentum. Please welcome uh, John Brown from Stinco. Great. Uh, thanks, Zach. Nice drum roll. Uh, we've had quite the year, haven't we? 
there's really been a lot of adversity and it's not really been easy for us. I'm pretty sure a year ago, no one would have thought that we'd be having virtual events and re remotely networking. But I'm a bit of an optimist and take away from this a feeling of gratitude to have had this opportunity to interact with so many people it would not have been possible to have met with during our three months together. This actually worked out great for, per me, for me personally, since I'm much more awkward uh, when I'm standing in front of people. <laughs> so that said, and on behalf of the Stenko team, and especially my co-founder, Alex Georgianis, I'd like to thank the Plug and Play team, the mentors, and the corporate partners for this recognition. Inclusion into the Plug and Play Accelerator has truly been one of the great thrills of our, our company. The program's renowned as an accelerator around the world, and those startups that have, that have been selected have kind of hit a little bit of a lottery. Uh, but what is an accelerator? In common usage, it's just going fast. But I really like the Newtonian definition because I'm a nerd and it's much more applicable. And that says an increase in velocity. Velocity is an increase in speed, sure, but it's more about direction or just as much about. No use in going faster if you don't have a place where you're going. Making progress towards a goal. Plug and play puts you on start on a path towards that goal from day one. You get introductions to team contacts, all sorts of benefits, schedules, resources. Then you get your mentors that come in and give you guidance and course corrections to really hone your message and focus. You then get valuable contacts from corporate partners and interactions that you could really only dream of before. All that, and you even get a full email inbox every single day as a bonus. The Plug and Play ecosystem has been enlightening and exciting to Stenco, and we're truly thankful to have interacted with you all. We sincerely hope that we can grow the relationships that we have started here and continue to be a part of your future sustainability plans. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, thank you very much, John, for all of your participation. So uh, lastly, uh, we would like to move on to our mentorship award winner ceremony. Now, this is a first for uh, our mentors and our corporate advisors uh, for, to be awarded. Uh, we are selecting the winner for this award based on several factors, such as uh, startup feedback, their relationship with uh, uh, their plug and play, as well as their dedication and commitment to our ecosystem. We have our mentor award winner, as well as our corporate advisory uh, award winner. So this year, our uh, award winners are Chris Mossing and Mini Zotos. Uh, Mini actually used to be the champion for Tyson Foods, uh, but as a senior manager of business ventures at Al Alveston Companies, he has come, uh, come on as a mentor to help our startups learn best practices. He's a forward-thinking and enthusiastic leader of over 15 years of consumer products uh, experience, and he's put that to good use, enabling our startups uh, to more seamlessly collaborate with our partners. Uh, Chris uh, has actually been uh, helping our program for about four years now. Uh, he is a uh, sales coach uh, for uh, startup found founders, helping them build repeatable sales models to generate uh, predictable revenue. He's been helping our startups create a strong value proposition, develop target, uh, target marketing campaigns, set up CRM systems, and so much more uh, to help our startups in our ecosystem. On behalf of Plug and Play, we thank you uh, so much for recognizing the importance of external innovation partnering with us to help startups to, uh, uh, across the ecosystem. Our efforts combined with the committed and passionate mentors like you will aid us in shaping the future of our programs together. We truly appreciate the energy and optimism you have brought to our programs, our organization, and more importantly, to our entrepreneurs. We look forward to continuing this rewarded and productive collaboration. So next, uh, just, uh, just to go on, we're gonna move on to our networking session. As I mentioned earlier, this will be via Remo. So we do have, a, a, um, this session will be invite only, exclusive to corporations, mentors, and members within our ecosystem. So we're going to play a short a tutorial on how to use Remo on the next slide, and then please find the link in your calendar invite sent by Gabriella. All right, thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Ho Yin. I am the founder of Remo. Today, I'm gonna to give you a quick walkthrough on how to use Remo. When you get the Remo event URL, you will then land on this event landing page. You will see a countdown if the event hasn't started, but since the event has started right now, what you wanna do is click on join event now. Here, you will enter in your email, and you can also log in with Google. Type in your name with your password, please create a new password and a new account uh, when you enter here and click on join event now. 
This event allows you to use your microphone and camera to build meaningful connections with others. So please click on allow camera microphone, click on allow, check that your camera and all of your microphone works here and you can change it by clicking on each of these. If you have camera and mic issues, click on the need help button on the bottom left corner here and we would chat uh, with you. Our chat support will help you. If everything works, click on cam and mic works, join event. When you land on the space, your microphone auto automatically turns on. You can also turn on your ca camera over here by pressing this button. And you can turn them both off by turning this off. When you turn on your camera, um, you can also switch to tile view right here like this. And you can also click the back to map to go back to your map. You can also uh, click double click on each table to go to that table, so you can see here. And when you go to a different table, you will only see and view the people that are active on that table and with their video and camera turned on. So if I double click back here, I will only see uh, the other individuals here um, that have their videos and cameras turned on. After that, if you click on any person's avatar, if they've connected their LinkedIn, you can see their name, their profile, and the company that they work for. You can also connect them on LinkedIn here and view their profile, book them a meeting if they have a booking link connected, or message them. Well, with that, we will conclude all of our sessions today. This wraps up uh, Fall Summit for the Food and Beverage Program. Uh, thank you so much for attending. If you have any comments or feedbacks, please reach out to Gabriela or anybody else on the team. Uh, we'll see you all in the networking session.